Now let's please give our attention to Jeff Mao. Well, it's really an honor to be the superintendent of Glacier National Park, but I've also got to say, boy, are we lucky to have such a landscape outside our back door. Um, it is just a place that, you know, needless to say, is a place of, you know, provides inspiration for song, uh, recreation, rejuvenation, um, even economy. And that's uh, a really, uh, that's really a gift. Um, it's also a place of tradition. The last year and a half that I've been here, and this is my first national park where I've been superintendent, that's actually older than the National Park Service itself. So that says something. But it's really those traditions that go back many, many generations that really I find uh, quite inspiring. The connectivity that the communities have to Glacier National Park are really something that I have not experienced in my Park Service career. And it's, you know, sort of in that tradition, I'm the 22nd superintendent of, the, of Glacier National Park, and that, you know, connection to that, you know, I stand on the shoulders of those who come before me. I also sort of get to sort of carry that tradition forward, but more and more, what we're realizing is we're starting to see things that are very, very different than things they, they um, uh, ran into or, or experienced as, as they were superintendents. Uh, about 12 years ago, even before sort of climate change become really, really a big topic, uh, amongst the superintendents in Alaska, we tried to have conversations about climate change, and we really had a hard time doing that because it, you know, climate change is such an overwhelming topic, comes at you in, in so many different ways. And that, uh, you know, what we found is, is, gosh, how do we do this? How do we, because of the uncertainty, because of the complexity, we had a very difficult time. So since then, I've been doing a lot of work on how we navigate that uncertainty. But first, let me go back and tell you a story about uh, an experience I had at Kenai Fjords National Park as a superintendent. And it's a place that we, you know, we like to say where ice, mountains, and ocean meet. Um, and it's an area that probably looks very similar to what Northwest Montana looked like 10 or 12,000 years ago. It's an area that was covered by a large ice field. From that ice field, we have these uh, glaciers that go down to the fjords, and at Kenai Fjords, these fjords face right out onto the Gulf of Alaska. And it's an area that's been, also been undergoing change, similar to what, you know, we see in Glacier, only the change is probably a magnitude or so larger. But again, we also have these great photos from a hundred years ago that can help us understand that change. But just in the last 10 or 15 years, some of that change has become even more profound. I always like to show this because this is a picture of a young girl taken by her parents in 1999. And this is the same girl taken 15 years later as a National Park Service interpreter. You know, this, the change is dramatic. And so her ability to tell stories, to t talk about climate change, you know, it's just, it was very, very um, powerful. She really had a bully pulpit from which to talk about climate change. The exit glacier area that uh, I just shown pictures of, this is the area that we've been studying for a long time about uh, as far as the glaciers there go. And we've done lots of mapping of the perimeter and over time and, and you know, what you see sort of uh, at that, uh, right in the center of the picture, you see a number of lines that are clustered together. Those represent the period of time, just about the time the park was first established. Just about the time that the park was getting all its infrastructure built, its roads, its trails, um, all its visitor center, everything was being developed at that time. But then as those lines, as you go towards the, the bottom left, you see those lines get further apart and they move backwards. That's how the glacier has behaved in the last 10 or 15 years, is this rapid recession. So that sets the stage for, for my story, which uh, began in uh, 2008, July 2008. Right at the height of our visitor se season, we began experiencing flooding across the main road getting to Exit Glacier. And um, this road, when the flooding occurred, it would be about no more two to four inches deep 
going across about a quarter mile section of the road, silty, you lost sight of the center line, fog line, everything. Um, and, uh, you know, we had, to, we had to close the park. So here we were closing the park in the middle of the visitor season. First time ever the park actually had sort of had to do this because normally we get floods and when our roads do flood, it's in the late fall or early spring when we get those heavy rains. So this was new to us. When the floods receded, we, could, we were left with roads and we noticed that, you know, okay, we're getting the sheet washed, but it's not really washing the road away. Um, so that got us to thinking, okay, so, so, so what's going on here? And is this a one-off? You know, is this, is this, you know, something that we have to sort of put up with for over uh, several years, or is this just a one-off? We worked with the highway department. They said, you know, the way this sheet wash is coming, you can actually operationalize this. If you can convince the public to drive across this flooded section of road, it's safe. And we thought, oh, great, you know, we can open the park back up, you know, how wonderful is that? But, you know, it took a little doing, you know, I had to, I, I had to send my staff to highway flagging school. And this is not something that people come to work for the National Park Service to do. <laughs> you know, they, and, and it was a real adjustment for a lot of them, sort of, in this mode. Um, and, but what we really found was that the visitors themselves didn't know what to do with this flooded road, because we would have... Um, Local folks that would drive down, big pickup trucks, you know, they come up, see that road, turn around, that's it. Um, you know, they'd been so well trained by the weather service, that if the road's flooded, you don't drive across it, even if the ranger says it's okay. <laughs> then, then we had some of the overseas tourists who were driving, you know, the smallest rental cars and nothing was going to stop them. <laughs> but... Um, you know, and it was an experience. You know, I, I was out there one time, you know, standing on the side of the road watching this traffic go by and, and watching these, these little white knuckled drivers trying to get through this flooding thing. And, you know, it was so disconcerting for them to hear the rumble of the water on their floorboards. And, and you know, we try to, keep, them to keep, the, keep their speed down so they don't hydroplane. But this one guy just couldn't take it anymore. Whoosh, just covered me head to toe in water. So. Interesting experience. Even the weather service came to us and said, you know, we don't know what to do with your flooding because our paradigm says flooding is caused by weather events and big storm events. And probably what I failed to mention is that, you know, this flooding we were getting was actually on those sunnier, warmer days. And so is flooding due to the glacier melting. And so, you know, that really is what sort of leapt out to me as to, to say, we are in a new era. We are in this sort of no historical analog future right in front of us. So some of the takeaways from that uh, story is prepare for the unexpected. Uh, history may not necessarily be our guide to the future. You know, we are starting to see things with respect to climate change that are sort of outside the range of variability that we're used to. Um, Organizationally, how can we be more flexible in the face of climate change, in, in the face of this increased variability uh, that we're seeing? Um, also to recognize some of the change we may be seeing may not be we know the answers as to why it's going on, and, and to think sort of how an interim solution to get you by, to, until you really understand what's going on, might be the best way to, way to go, and that's what we did at, at Kenai Fjords. You know, and again, it's, it's one thing for your organization to make the shift, but it's another to bring the public along with you. And that, that takes a lot of work uh, in, in adapting to some of this change. And plan for complexity and uncertainty. Complexity and uncertainty is the biggest challenge, I think. So moving forward, moving forward with my peer superintendents on, you know, how do we anticipate, how do we navigate this world of what I like to call the no analog future. And I'll go back to the historic photos. I'll go back to you know, those who helped establish the National Park Service originally, uh, almost 100 years ago, um, and, what the, and then what they did. What did they anticipate? You know? and, and sort of from them, there's a lot of tradition that came. And a lot of that tradition is sort of the, if you as a manager can just manage these parks as vignettes of primitive America, you'll be fine, you know, meaning, 
you know, sort of minimize the human disturbance, you know, try to manage for intact ecosystem, try to, you know, ensure that you're, you know, the full, as many of the wild animals, you know, and, and, are, and the native species are there, and you'll be all right. But, that, but, you know, certainly in the face of climate change, that doesn't hold true. And uh, I'm lucky because I work for an organization, the National Park Service, where even at the highest levels, we recognize climate change as probably our biggest challenge coming at us. So how do we navigate this? What can we do? Uh, talk about complexity a little bit. This is a mind map that somebody drew up uh, on the uh, stability in Afghanistan, you know, and tries to sort of show the linkages between any number of things, whether it's the uh, you know, the Afghan forces and their ability, the ability to move resources around. I mean, it's, it's very complex. And you can see why it can be paralyzing in terms of knowing what to do. Also, uncertainty. Uncertainty occurs in a lot of different ways. Um, and uh, this, you know, there are a variety of management frameworks you can use when facing uncertainty. And this graph just shows uh, you know, that in situations where you have high levels of uncertainty and very little controllability over the situation, they talk about using a technique called scenario planning. And that's what we did in the National Park Service. A little more on uncertainty. You know, I, I like to break down that, you know, there's uncertainty in many, many ways. There's uncertainty with respect to the climate and where that's headed. There's uncertainty about the management actions that we take in reaction to, to what the climate's doing. And then, of course, huge uncertainty with understanding what the response of the ecosystems will be. So, thinking scenarically about the future, thinking about the multiple plausible possible futures that are out there, and that's what scenarios uh, planning is about. Now, scenario planning is something that's been around a while. Uh, probably the most uh, well-known commercial application of it was by Royal Dutch Shell in the late 60s, where there they had kind of a skunk works group look at these issues of um, what are possible, plausible futures. If we don't try to predict the future, what's possible that could happen? And one of their scenarios actually uh, came up with the, the idea that you know, one of the major oil pipelines in the Mideast, this is the late 60s, keep in mind, one of the major oil pipelines in uh, the Middle East is going to get disrupted and the oil flow will shut off. What will this mean to our business? That's the approach they took. And so they realized, wow, you know, we're not really well diversified. We need to make some investments elsewhere in the world, which is what Royal Dutch Shell did in the late 60s. So, by the, um, of course, when the, or oil Arab, the Arab oil embargo occurred, Shell Oil was well positioned. Uh, one last uh, application of scenario planning was in 1991, just a year after Nelson Mandela was freed from prison. South Africa convened, actually asked Royal Dutch Shell to convene for them a scenario planning workshop to look at what's possible in South Africa to look at what could South Africa look at like. So the National Park Service took this, we ran with it. Uh, at the heart of it in scenario planning is again, you're, you're not trying to forecast the future, you're trying to think of a, a lot about the uncertainties and come up with multiple plausible possible futures, a whole range of futures. So at Glacier National Park, we did this in 2010 and uh, we looked at, you know, what are some of the uncertainties we know the least about? And in our case, it was temperature change and uh, precipitation, changes in precipitation patterns. And we came up with three uh, scenarios. The first being something we call climate complacency. That's a situation where, you know, there's not a huge range, huge change from what we can, would consider normal range of variability. There is the Colorado bounces or creeps north, which is the idea that, uh, you know, the, the climate looks more like what you would find in Colorado, that um, there's a, quite a bit of variability from year to year in terms of what you'll see. And then there's something that we called the race to the refuge, which was the idea that uh, 
things are changing really, really fast. Um, and it's just not about the climate scenario. We also nest into the climate scenarios stories about what society is at, where the organization's at, what's our capability to respond to it. So we come up with these, range, these scenarios, that narratives that talk about um, what the future could look like. So what do we do with those? We um, actually start thinking about the management actions that we could be taking now that could be in response to change in the future. And there's decisions we can make that are we call robust decisions, decisions that apply to a wide variety of possible futures. Other decisions might be bet the farm, you know, that we really are sort of hoping and fingers crossed that, uh, you know, that the future is going to look a certain way. Uh, there's hedge your bets. You know, you might make, you know, these, the idea of placing uh, several bets of equal proportion across the different scenarios. And then there's this core and satellite idea. We have, a, we have make a, a core decision, and then we have some satellite decisions, uh, a little, you know, distributed across the three scenarios. So really, it's sort of, you know, as, as I think about staffing, as I think about, um, you know, infrastructure, uh, when I have the opportunity to replace infrastructure, I should be looking at these and thinking about um, my strategies in an uncertain future. And some of you have probably gotten in your mailboxes by now, you know, these, uh, what we're calling preliminary concept alternatives for the going to the Sun Road corridor. And even there, we've actually done some scenario work and applied them and come up with a uh, preliminary alternative five, which is that one that sort of gives us a lot of ad adapt, adapt ability to adapt to a lot of changing conditions, gives us a lot of flexibility in the face of uncertainty, uh, uncertainty with visitation, uncertainty with technology, uh, uncertainty with, with the climate itself. So, oop. Um, well. so the Park Service, you know, we, we see two, two and a quarter million visitors to, to Glacier National Park every year. We really have a bully pulpit to begin talking about uh, climate change. And the thing about climate change is that, you know, if you just sort of look at what's happening, it's, it can be a bit of a downer, you know. And, and you know, we really want to communicate a message of hope uh, uh, a message of what's, um, you know, what's the possibilities. And that's where scenario planning, I think, really helps us in terms of talking about climate change uh, to the public. Uh, organizationally, you know, scenario planning is important in terms of us uh, rehearsing the future to avoid management surprises. What can we be doing to think about that? But also, um, I had a mentor about 20 years ago, and he gave me this piece of advice and he really didn't know what to do with it at the time. But in the face of climate change, where there is so much uncertainty, I think he was sort of, he understood that there was gonna be more and more ambiguity in the way we do our jobs, that certainty was, was gonna be less and less over time. And so um, I think, you know, personally, I've sort of taken that on to, to, to feel comfortable working in the gray um, knowing that uh, there's going to be a lot of possibilities of how the future may play out. So, thank you.